Welcome to the Kentucky Labor Cabinet Office of Occupational Safety and Health online training resource. This class is presented as a service of the Division of Education and Training. Please read the following disclaimer, and when you're ready to continue, click the forward arrow below. Welcome to the course, Scaffolding, Erecting, Dismantling, and Access. In this module, you will be introduced to the standards that apply to erecting and dismantling scaffolds. You will also learn about the design, assembly, disassembly, and moving of scaffolding. And finally, we'll take a look at a number of different ways to safely access scaffolds. The U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics released its annual National Census of Fatal Occupational Injuries Report for 2019 and reported that the private construction industry had 1,061 fatal injuries for the year. That's up 5% from 2018 and the sector's highest number of worker deaths since 2007. A total of 28 states had more fatal injuries in 2019 than 2018, while 21 states had fewer. Federal OSHA is a relatively small agency. With our state partners, we have approximately 1,850 inspectors, responsible for the health and safety of 130 million workers, employed at more than 8 million work sites around the nation. This translates to roughly one compliance officer for every 70,000 workers. We talk a lot about the competent person and the qualified person in the eyes of OSHA. So let's first identify what that really means. According to OSHA, a competent person is one who is capable of identifying existing and predictable hazards in the surroundings or work conditions, which are unsanitary, hazardous, or dangerous to employees and who has the authorization to take prompt corrective measures to eliminate them. In this case, this is typically someone who holds a scaffolding high-risk work license. While a qualified person is one who has successfully demonstrated his or her ability to solve or resolve problems related to the subject matter, the work, or the project. In this case, a qualified person has the right background, such as education or a degree in designing safe scaffolding. For example, this could be someone from the scaffold manufacturer or trained scaffold engineer. A qualified person must be on site when scaffolding is erected or dismantled, and they must also inspect the components of the scaffolding, and they must train the employees that assemble and disassemble the scaffolding. 1926.451E9 Roman numeral 1 states, The employer shall provide safe means of access for each employee erecting or dismantling a scaffold, where the provision of safe access is feasible and does not create a greater hazard. The employer shall have a competent person determine whether it is feasible or would pose a greater hazard to provide and have employees use safe means of access. This determination shall be based on site conditions and the type of scaffolding being erected or dismantled. 1926.451 F3 states, Scaffolds and scaffold components shall be inspected for visible defects by a competent person before each work shift and after any occurrence which could affect the scaffold's structural integrity. Employers are required to provide fall protection for employees erecting or dismantling supported scaffolds where the installation and use of such protection is feasible and does not pose a greater hazard. 1926.451G2 states, Effective September 2, 1997, the employer shall have a competent person determine the feasibility and safety of providing fall protection for employees erecting or dismantling supported scaffolds. Scaffold tags are used to protect the lives of workers as they identify if a scaffold is safe or unsafe for use. All scaffold identification tags will be of solid green, yellow, or red color with black lettering. This enables the competent person to identify the scaffolds which have been inspected. While this is not an OSHA requirement, it is a good practice used throughout the construction industry. In construction, scaffolds are an integral part of the industry, with approximately 65% of the workforce involved in work from scaffolds. When used properly, scaffolds can save significant time and money. In this section, we will look at a number of different ways to access scaffolds. Access to scaffold platforms must be provided when the platform is two feet above or below an access point. This can be accomplished by providing portable ladders, stair towers, ramps, and walkways, integral prefabricated scaffold platforms, or direct access from another surface. Please note that access requirements for employees erecting or dismantling supported scaffolds are specifically addressed in CFR 1926.451E9. First of all, 
even though contractors and safety experts will tell you it's unsafe, climbing cross braces to get up on scaffolds continues to occur in the workplace. OSHA requires ladders, stairways, and other methods of safe access to scaffolds and never allows this practice. Climbing the structural cross braces of a scaffold is unsafe, specifically forbidden by federal standards. Constructing high-rise buildings means limited access from which to work, and scaffolding allows workers to reach areas they might struggle to access otherwise. Direct access to or from another surface shall be used only when the scaffold is not more than 14 inches horizontally and not more than 24 inches vertically from the other surface. OSHA estimates there are 24,000 injuries and as many as 36 fatalities per year due to falls on stairways and ladders used in construction. Scaffold platforms that are located more than two feet above or below the ground must provide access to the scaffold platform. This includes portable ladders, hook-on or attachable ladders, and stairway-type ladders designed to access the scaffolding. Sometimes a general contractor specifies the access required. Whether you should rent access ladders from the scaffold manufacturer or use your own depends on the job size and complexity. It's almost always more expensive to use rented ladders than your own until you go over 30 feet high. Now let's take a look at some of the different types of ladders. A straight ladder is the most common type of ladder used to access supported scaffolding. They are easily moved, but they do need to be secured to the platform by rope, wire, or other effective means. Portable, hook-on, and attachable ladders shall be positioned so as to not tip the scaffolding over. Hook-on and attachable ladders shall be positioned so that their bottom rung is not more than 24 inches above the scaffold supporting level. When hook-on and attachable ladders are used on supported scaffolds more than 35 feet high, they shall have rest platforms at 35-foot maximum vertical intervals. Hook-on and attachable ladders shall be specifically designed for use with the type of scaffold used. They shall have a minimum rung length of 11 and a half inches, and they shall have uniformly spaced rungs with a maximum spacing between rungs of 16 and 3 quarter inches. Stairway type ladders shall be positioned such that their bottom step is not more than 24 inches above the scaffold supporting level. They must be provided with rest platforms at 12 foot maximum vertical intervals. Stairway type ladders have many advantages and are a practical solution for tight spaces. They shall have a minimum step width of 16 inches, except that mobile scaffold stairway type ladders shall have a minimum step width of 11 and a half inches and have slip resistant treads on all steps and landings. Along with a smaller footprint, stairway type ladders are faster to assemble than a stair tower. We will discuss stair towers in the next slides. Stairway type ladders will not use the same amount of materials and may be more practical when there's less egress or ingress onto the scaffold platform. A stairway type ladder works best when the platform is not very high. As a safer option, stair towers have gained popularity over the past few years. Stair towers offer faster access to the platform of the scaffolding and allow multiple workers to use the stairs at the same time, even in different directions. Stair towers shall be positioned such that their bottom step is not more than 24 inches above the scaffold supporting level. A stair rail consisting of a top rail and a mid rail shall be provided on each side of each scaffold stairway. The top rail of each stair rail system shall be capable of serving as a handrail unless a separate handrail is provided. Handrails and top rails that serve as handrails shall provide an adequate handhold for employee grasping them to avoid falling. Stair rail systems and handrails shall be surfaced to prevent injury to employees from punctures or lacerations and to prevent snagging of clothing. The ends of stair rail systems and handrails shall be constructed so that they do not constitute a projection hazard. Handrails and top rails that are used as handrails shall be at least three inches from other objects. Stair rails shall not be less than 28 inches, nor more than 37 inches, from the upper surface of the stair rail to the surface of the tread, in line with the face of the riser at the forward edge of the tread. A landing platform at least 18 inches wide, by at least 18 inches long, shall be provided at each level. Each scaffold stairway shall be at least 18 inches wide between stair rails, and treads and landings shall have slip-resistant surfaces. The riser height should be uniform, within one quarter inch for each flight of stairs. Greater variations in riser height are allowed for the top and bottom steps of the entire system, not for each flight of stairs. Tread depth shall be uniform, within one quarter inch for each flight of stairs. 
Ramps and walkways six feet or more above lower levels shall have guardrail systems which comply with 1926 subpart M fall protection. No ramp or walkway shall be inclined more than a slope of one vertical to three horizontal degrees, 20 degrees above horizontal. If the slope of a ramp or walkway is steeper than one vertical to eight horizontal degrees, the ramp or walkway shall have cleats not more than 14 inches apart, which are securely fastened to the planks to provide footing. Fabricated frame scaffolds are the most common type of scaffold because they are versatile, economical, and easy to use. Integral prefabricated scaffold access frames shall be specifically designed and constructed for use as ladder rungs and have a rung length of at least 8 inches. However, they are not to be used as work platforms when the rungs are less than 11.5 inches in length, unless each affected employee uses fall protection or a positioning device, which complies with 1926.502. They must also be uniformly spaced within each frame section. Also, integral prefabricated scaffold access frames must be provided with rest platforms at 35-foot maximum vertical intervals on all supported scaffolds more than 35 feet high and they shall have a maximum spacing between rungs of 16 and 3 quarter inches. Non-uniform rung spacing caused by joining end frames together is allowed, provided the resulting space does not exceed 16 and 3 quarters inches. The steps and rungs of ladder and stairway type access shall line up vertically with each other between the rest platforms. This concludes scaffolding, erecting, dismantling, and access. Be sure to check out the other free online safety and health courses on our website, and as always, thank you for taking this course.